This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. The man behind one of television's most enduring characters, Sesame Street's Big Bird. You'll meet Carol Spinney on this edition of Conversations. Big Bird is woven into the fabric of international media, and Carol Spinney is the man who makes the feathered personality come to life. Discovered by Muppets founder Jim Henson, Spinney has been playing Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch since the beginning of Sesame Street. Despite the time and changes in media, Big Bird and his fellow characters continue to resonate with children around the globe. Spinney chronicles life lessons he has learned in his book, The Wisdom of Big Bird and the Dark Genius of Oscar the Grouch. The story of Spinney's life and career were recently brought to film with the release of the documentary, I Am Big Bird, The Carol Spinney Story. We're pleased to have Carol Spinney on this edition of Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Oh, what a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so very much. How did you become Big Bird? Well, I've been doing puppets since I was a little kid. That helped. I was kind of rehearsed. <laughs> and uh, Jim was looking for somebody to play uh, the bird, which he hadn't built yet. And he had just gotten a commission to join the Sesame Street. A lot okay. of people said, oh, Jim created Sesame Street. No, well, he created his part of it, but not until they had already gone a couple of pi pilots realized they should have puppets. Okay. John Stone, who was one of the creators of the show, said there really should be some puppets on the show. So, uh, and he said, and those puppets should be the Muppets. I have to agree with him. <laughs> and uh, so Jim was looking for him, uh, somebody to play him, and I went to a puppet festival, and uh, he saw me doing my stuff, and. Uh, Long story short, he, he hired me. <laughs> he hired you right there. Now, I understand you kind of had a rough day that day, though, at the Yeah, at the everything festival. went wrong with my show. I tried to make an elaborate attempt at um, a new approach to uh, make a new media, Come, uh, combine animation with live puppetry. Okay. So uh, some part of the production would have to be tediously made under animation. And... Um, my, and the puppets would then react to what was on the screen, and the screen was designed so the puppets could actually change places. And then my case, in this case, I just had to choose simple triangles of white. And the way I, I at florist shop, florist shop, I bought uh, uh, some white styrofoam cones, and those were the puppets to start with. Uh, this was just a demo that these could be made with any kind of characters. Right, right, and. Uh, uh, if it, I, it worked out very well. I gave it, it in Binghamton. I gave a little show of it, and it, it went very well. And uh, the I, I did to set up at this big theater in Salt Lake City, at the at university, and it was a big elaborate theater. And my my theater was big and elaborate too. Had a rear screen projection, and I'm an, I was an animator, so I animated these things, and worked out in my mind the choreography how it was going to work. And so I presented the show in the thing. I got down, I, I had to get down on my knees. I padded the floor because I had to crawl around my knees, turn on switches and things with my knees. It was a one-man show. I needed, I really needed a, a, uh, uh, an extra person, a technician or something, yeah. something better than what I could do. Any, but what uh, happened was I, I'm starting the music, which is a separate connection, not, not synced with it. But if you'd start them at the same time, it would work. Mm -hmm. But I looked up, I saw him performing, and I, I then pop up the puppets. I look at my screen up behind me, and I can't see it. It's a big white mass of light. And I, I raised myself a little bit to look over the edge of the theater, and I could see there was a huge spotlight uh, that I had not set up when I set the whole show up before dinner. Yeah. And... Uh, I couldn't see this picture, so I couldn't stay in sync. I had to stop the tape, stop the thing. Now, how would I even cue it up again in front of an audience? Right. Back up the film? How do you back up a film? <laughs> the the 60-millimeter projectors don't back up. You <laughs> right. know. And uh, so I, I was desperate. I got up, and apparently I was pretty funny in my desperation. I knew Jim Henson was in the audience. So uh, uh, <laughs> I... 
I couldn't get the, I said, why don't you tur turn off that big floodlight, please? It wasn't there. I didn't ask for that to be on, and I can't see the show. I can't do, do it with that on. And I, 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 these are students running this thing. Right. They said, we don't know how. I hear them <laughs> yelling from up there. So, well, my suggestion, since they're light switches, the ones that say on, push them to off. <laughs> One of them is going to be that light, no doubt. <laughs> click, click, click. Nothing. No, it's still on. Well, there's something that turned it on. Look around. <laughs> Must be something. Finally, I, it's, I asked if anybody had a rifle. I could take it out <laughs> myself. You know. and, but um, um, I don't know. I, the rest of this thing was a bit of a nightmare for me. I don't know how I did any of, a, of the show. And um, But obviously he saw something in you he liked. Yeah, uh, so I was pretty depressed. As, uh, I got an applause at the end. The last bit, I managed to cue it up good for a, a scene of the seagull flying through an endless zoom in. And uh, you could do that with dissolves and uh, a, a nice animation stand. <laughs> I, uh, I, that, so I got an applause. I was pleased. I said, well, you missed all the rest, so I, I, we can't really give you your money back. But uh, that was your <laughs> evening, folks. That, that's all. <laughs> and uh, so I, I was a little depressed. I was packing stuff in my car. Oh, yeah. And uh, I hear a voice behind me. He said, I like what you're trying to do. It was Jim Henson. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite favorable. He said, you were very funny. I said, yeah, but that wasn't what I planned. He said, yeah, but you, you handled it well for, you know, being, making it funny. We were all laughing right, right. a great deal. And uh, he recounted some awful things that happened for him. And, right. uh, you don't know how you're going to get out of those things at the moment, but somehow the day ends. Yeah. And uh, so, so he asked if I'd meet him in the lounge. A little while I did. Brought my little girl Jessie with me, and um, she she curls up on his lap, and he says, "Why don't you come to New York and talk about the Muppets?" I said, "Well, what does that mean?" I'd heard that before, right. 1962. I did a little show, and it, it, he was uh, using the same theater I did for a little bit of what he did, and uh, he said. Uh, uh, why don't you come down? He liked what I was doing. Why don't you come down and talk about the Muppets? I thought he wanted to just talk shop, mm -hmm. and I didn't have enough money to want to drive to New York just to chat. Right, right. So here I see the hear the same thing seven years later, and um, I said, so I said, I think I better inquire a little further. What do you mean? Well, you know, work with me. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll give it a thought. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what kind of guy was he? What kind of he guy was Jim Henson? He was um, funny. He was absolutely charismatic in some ways, yet he was very soft-spoken. And um, I remember one morning we were in, into the show about half a year. It was a cold winter's morning. He came in, and he was kind of red-cheeked because of the, how frosty it was outside. But somehow he seemed to glow. With a, just a, he was unlike anybody I ever knew, and uh, it's, I have to admit I was in awe, but I, I was in awe 20, 20 years later with him, mm. even though we became really buddies. Right, he was a genius, huh? He was an absolute genius, yeah. and uh, one who was quite funny. And uh, if you want to know his character, think of Ernie, the little Dickens that Ernie was at times. Okay. The trickster, Jim was a little bit like that. He'd pull tricks on. Now, how did it come about where you played both? Oscar the Grouch and Big Bird. That was, uh, when I, I saw, when he, we went up to the lounge, I met him, and uh, he said, uh, <clears throat> I, I've been mind, uh, he asked me if I'd ever heard of Sesame Street. It hadn't been on the air yet, except for a couple of pilots. Mm -hmm. I had, so some people knew about it. I said, no, I hadn't. So he uh, said, well, I want to have you play two characters I want to create. One, a big goofy bird, and a very uh, irritable, grouchy character who lives in a pile of trash. And he's very into trash. So <laughs> that's just a rough idea. Not quite the way it really worked out. Right. Uh, they built the bird around. I said yes, and we settled on a price, and, um, which was nowhere near enough to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't know what I, the taxes would take over half. Right, right. And that wasn't enough to live on. It was $100 less than my monthly rent, and I already was keeping my house in the country. So it was a rough time. I can imagine. But uh, he, uh, uh, 
I, I, I stuck to it. Eventually, we got through all that stuff. And um, I decided about three months into the show that the bird was a little uh, kind of as a goofy yokel. Didn't really suit him being on. Uh, why, why is he on this show? I said, I think he'd be more productive and useful to you if he was a, ki a kid. So why don't I just, I'll just light up his voice over the next week, not just change it for tomorrow. Right. And we'll just have him, you know, get to learn more about him, that he's a kid who's only four, I, I decided he was four and a half because he couldn't read or write or anything. So like that, uh, no any letters. And uh, it, so they, they thought it was a good idea. We said, sure, let's do that. And it, it did it right away. It promoted um, the idea of the, one of the best songs. Uh, Big Bird sees the alphabet as the whole A, B, C, D, E, F, G. He says, how do you pronounce that? Ab, A, B, D, D, E, F, Def. Ab, Def, Ab, Def, Ab, Def, Key, Jack, Jekyll, Monopris, Stu, Rixes. Ab, Def, Key, Jekyll, Monopris, Stu, Rixes. It's the most remarkable word I've ever seen. And he gets all excited and... Um, is then, then we we presented a number of times on the show with, with a whole bunch of the, the alphabet uh, where Big Bird could just reach a point at each thing, and uh, I didn't even notice that it, it one of the lines is in the, somewhere in the middle it gets awful queer to me. That's the letters Q and R right in the middle. Okay. If he says so, Joe Raposo who wrote it says be sure to point when you say somewhere in the middle it gets awful queer to me, and you point to the Q R so people get that little. Subtle joke. <laughs> <laughs> and so at what point did you realize that you had a hit on your hands? Uh, well, it, it, right away we got pretty good cl acclaim. And uh, I, I remember uh, we, our first guest was Cleveland Amory, a writer who criticized um, television in a TV Guide. And so... Uh, I, he, he decided he was going to interview Oscar, and so I said, "Okay, I'll be in. I'll get in there, and you knock on his can, and Oscar will come out." Mm -hmm. So he knocks on the trash can, and the lid flies open, and Oscar says, "What do you want?" <laughs> he says, "Well, I'm, I'm here to uh, uh, talk to you." So yeah, well, who are you? Who are you? Well, I'm Cleveland Amory. Oh, you the guy that has that. That uh, thing in every week in TV Guide, you know, about the, criticizing the shows? Yes. Do you, do you like it? Yeah, it stinks. <laughs> he says, oh, I'm, I'm uh, sorry you feel that way because I'm about to review this show. <laughs> well, I uh, hope I wasn't a little too hasty there. <laughs> and, but it all they went very well. Yeah. We got a fabulous review. <laughs> and I... I, I, I went away with saying, gee, it's fun to insult people you've heard about. <laughs> and they enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, so it got so that often when guest stars would come, uh, I would actually, I, and I'm, I'm in awe that I'm in with the same room as, as a, a famous person, but I'll, I'll say, Oscar will say something that I could never say. Of all the guests that have been on over the years, who did you most enjoy or, or who are you most, shall we say, in awe of? Uh, Whenever I got to work with Jim Henson, of course, it was, uh, which was regular at the first few weeks. Um, but of all the people, I, I, I met him in my one movie, Follow That Bird. He was a turkey truck driver for that movie. Uh, he was driving a turkey turkey truck. And it actually, it was a, uh, a, a, a nice Chevy pickup, no, a flatbed car full of turkeys in the back, real live turkeys. And uh, he was playing the driver. And so I spent two days on this thing. It was being towed by a truck which you could tow. It was sitting next to us, and there was, there was a big room for cameras on that. Mm -hmm. And they could just shoot right in our window while we sang, It ain't no road too long. And uh, he picks, Big Bird is hitchhiking. He's trying to get back to, to uh, Sesame Street. Okay. And he, so uh, he says, how long do you think? Uh, it'll take you to get back there, Big Bird, because he tells him his name is Big Bird. And he's not famous in our stories. So uh, he says, oh, I think about three hours. And he says, no, about three weeks. <laughs> three weeks? And 
but we, we had such a fine time talking. And he, he just bared his soul, and, and we reached each other on a soul level and became true, deep friends. And um, here we're from totally different backgrounds. He was born in West Texas, and the, the outlaw cowboy, uh -huh. and uh, his share of, not a little naughty, I suppose. Yeah. I'm not, he's an awfully good man. Yeah. He's a good soul. So uh, he, he visited Sesame Street three different times. One song he wrote for Oscar was, Wrong. You think you know what you're doing? Wrong. You know, <laughs> and I, I can't remember all the words. But, yeah. Interesting. Uh, he, he, so I guess because I got to know him so closely yeah. that uh, he would have to stand out as one of the best. Yeah. Tell me about your trip to China and uh, you, the, I had an opportunity to see the documentary made about your life and I found it very intriguing that so you go to China you have a little girl who worked with you and then you guys left and years later pick up on that story right well the little girl was chosen they, they the story uh, was written by Joe Bailey and uh, John Stone and it was uh, a, a little joke got me the uh, thing. Should I tell a little joke? Sure. My wife is over there. Yeah, she did. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, 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 a little joke got me to China, I like to say. Okay. Because uh, I always wanted to go to China. Starting in 1947, I had a comic strip that was published in China about a Chinese dragon. I was only 13 when I started drawing, writing and drawing it. But it was because of a friend uh, who was a girl... Uh, but she was my best friend, mm -hmm. not a girlfriend, just a best friend. I got you. And uh, she, so I, I, they wanted me to know if I would donate art to this magazine that was in, half English, half American. I mean, Chinese. Chinese. So that, that's what got me. So I, I had such an interest in China. Uh, well, I, I was on the Bob Hope, invited to be on the Bob Hope show as a guest. And I get there and I have a meeting with him. He says, what's this bird like? What is it, a turkey? I <laughs> I've never seen it. You know, I don't, my kids are all grown up. And uh, so he, I said, well, it's, it's a, I, I tried to explain a little bit. He said, right. well, I don't know if that's going to work. He said, we wanted uh, Kermit the Frog. I said, yeah, but Jim Henson's so busy that, uh, that your writers felt that they could do something funny with me. So the jokes were all about Colonel Sanders' uh, <laughs> Is that the name of the yeah. chicken jokes? Yeah, yeah. So uh, they weren't that good, yeah. the jokes. Yeah. But uh, so I said, we really, uh, I got to I gotta win him over. So I thought, I usually don't think, I, I'm really good at spontaneous things happening to me. I realized I got that idea from my, that gift from my grouchy father. Yeah. He could be funny on the spot. <laughs> and scary too, <laughs> next minute, you know. That's what, that was his only flaw as far as I can see. Yeah. But uh so I, I he, well, I had Debu as my dresser, so I had her dress me. Uh, I'm all, already in the bird. Normally, I only get in when I know I have, I'm gone because it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. So she, he walks out and there's the eight foot two tall bird standing there. He says, "Geez, look at that!" And I said, "Boy, I thought I had a funny looking beak." <laughs> He was famous for his ski nose. <laughs> right, right. Which yeah. turned out he was 24. He got a boxing accident. It, it flattened his nose perfectly. Oh. You know, it's a really good job. I wish he could do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> it might hurt. But uh, anyway, he uh, he, he's, I, he walked over to me. He says, How, where are you in that thing? I says, boy, I didn't know you'd be so small. <laughs> he's 5'10", he's 5'11". Five, five, yeah. And uh, so uh, I... I uh, I'm only halfway up in the neck of the bird, my head. So I, I, he said, uh, that's a much, much funnier stuff than our other our crappy material. He was open with that. <laughs> so I have a letter I put on the wall from Bob Hope. Thanks for coming. You really made me laugh. <laughs> well, that's great. That's yeah, great. pretty good. He's, a, he's a kind of a famous guy. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Make him laugh. He had like a little that. bit of success. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's why he thought of me favorably when he had a chance to do the very first American TV show ever done in China in the modern day. Right, right. And so... Um, but you had, the, you had the movie with the young lady that you worked with. That, but Yes. So we came back from that uh, Bob Hope experience. 
spent a week, a month with him in China. It was fun. And uh, with <coughs> Baryshnikov and other people who have been with him. And then the, the uh, I went back and I said to Sesame Street, we got to take Big Bird to China. Right. Because Big Bird was with me. And uh, uh, so they came up with, and we suggested some ideas. Big Bird searches for the Phoenix. And um, so they wrote a story about that. And uh, uh, so the, what about it was a little girl comes and helps him. I don't know how she could be free to travel with him like that right. all over the country. Uh, so this little girl comes along and says, what's the matter? She actually couldn't speak a word of English. She was taught every line for weeks before she got to actually do it. Yeah. Therefore, you know, we, this with writing, we often will say something differently than in the, in the script. We'll change it right there. That bewildered her. We weren't even aware of it until a letter just came recently about how details we didn't know. We're delighted to know more. But anyway, we we fell in love with her and vice versa. So um, when our miserable month turn, uh, ended, it was a hard shoot. Yeah. And uh, we were going to go home. We, we barely could see her for a moment in the airport because they don't like Americans getting to know and be friendly to that much Chinese at that time. At that time, right. So uh, she, we, we, we cried. We held each other and hugged and cried. cried. And then they suddenly said, they, she has to go. And they took her away. And we didn't see it. We, we said, we'll write. We did. And she, she said she'd write. She didn't know how to write yet. She was, mm -hmm. was only <clears throat> five, really. And uh, so we never, they, they wouldn't deliver the letters to her. So. It's very sad. So we didn't see her until we heard through the internet that she had made connections through the internet. So uh, we finally made contact and uh, they called her and said, would she like to put her in the movie if she'd like to come? She came on her own expense all the way from Hong Kong. Wow. Now she can speak good, perfect English. You know? And uh, she's a beautiful, tall young woman. Yeah, I could tell sport. she was gonna be tall, even then she had long legs. This little five-year-old, wow. beautiful child. That was a wonderful experience, and uh, we were delighted to see her. We text her. We stay in touch with texting. <coughs> Excuse me, certainly. And uh, so, so I, I, I think our story is not over yet. With between us and she now calls herself Lisa. Her okay. real name was Lince, uh, and uh, she was known as Xiao Fu in the movie. Which means little lotus. Wow, well, that's a great story. <clears throat> Pardon me. In the in the documentary, if people have an opportunity to see it, it was a great great piece in there. What um, what's been the biggest change that you have noticed in Sesame Street over the period of time? Well, um, I, uh, quite a few. Uh, the, there's a lot of changes. They, they started out as a film, as an experience and experiment in film and for uh, video for children. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we, we, as we, they, they learned through things. They included things that were up to date culturally. And don't forget, in 45 years we've been on the air, uh, how much of the, how much can change? Oh you know, yeah, just culture. In general, yeah. yeah. Think of the cultural changes in the 45 years that started in 1900. Right. 1900 was still just horses and buggies, and very once in a while you. I actually saw a car today because there were only th six in the whole country or so. Right, right. And uh, <clears throat> so, but those, and then 45, we had finished World War II. Um, so they, we've had the same amount of time from we started. And people have changed. Uh, the, the government changes gradually. Cultural things change. Uh, things, some things seem to get better. Some get worse. It's all reflected, I think, in our, Sooner or later, we deal with it yeah, on our yeah. show. What are your plans? I've got about three minutes left here in the oh, broadcast. Really? Yeah, time, time fl flies when I'm talking too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> time flies when you're a big bird, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. we, we were, that's why he's still six years old. It's bird years. <laughs> there you go. I'm there. on a different phase of time. <laughs> how, many, how many more years will you continue to do this? Well, I hope to. I, I've been saying for quite a while now, I would like to do at least 50 years. We have another one. Um, I think we figured out that I think I'll be able to easily get to that 50. More if it's the, if they'd like to have me still do some stuff. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and I'm still physically able to do it since I've now entered my 80s. I was going to say, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I really think it, what an experience it has been. Yeah. And seeing people who watch it as little children when we started and they're now in their 40s and pushing 50, and uh, their children are growing up, and some of their children, this it's actually long enough so there's actually a third generation entering. Wow. So yeah. it's kind of nice to have been, to. I think if you were watching a show and you liked it a lot and you liked what Big Bird did, uh, and to know the same person is still playing it. Yeah, that, that is absolutely phenomenal. As you look back on your career, what are you most proud of? Oh, I, I don't know, I guess uh, uh, meeting a girl like Deb and marrying her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the best thing. It's, it's Big Bird and Oscar are the second best. Yeah. Well, you know, and unfortunately we're out of time, but I, I do want to tell the, the audience it's a great piece in the documentary about you and your wife, and the gra it's a great love story, huh? Yeah. Well, it's easy because... When you're madly in love, you don't have to make any plans. You just are in love. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell that's yeah. the case too. What's the secret to that? What's the what's the secret to that long, healthy relationship? I don't know. Uh, it's awfully uh, the right person, I guess, uh, yeah. for the right person. Uh, yeah. We we she's always in a, such a pleasant person to deal with, and I I'm pretty easy going to, yeah. and uh, we we never kvetch at each other very much. So you're more Big Bird than Oscar the Grouch. Very much so. She <laughs> says, is, only once in a while I'm driving. <laughs> is, is that true? It's the truth. Uh, okay. <laughs> it was Waylon Jennings, but that name was not dropped. I did mention Waylon Jennings? <laughs> wow. Hey, Waylon. Waylon. You're important. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, what an absolute pleasure to meet you. Oh, thank you. I hope I didn't talk too much. Oh, not at all. Not at all. Carol, thank you so very much. Best of luck to you. And, of course, uh, I would certainly encourage folks to take a look uh, and, and find that documentary. What a great story about your, your, your career in television. And as I mentioned before, what a great love story with, with you and your wife and, and so much uh, great stuff. And we'll continue to look forward to, to more and more of Sesame Street. Yeah. And more and more, I think, you can I think the HBO thing is going to be good for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it'll be on HBO and also continue on PBS as well. Yes, yeah. we have material that's already been done, mm -hmm. that so they won't have any period where they don't get new stuff on the show. Okay, apparently. awesome. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Best Jeff. of luck to you. Thank you, Carol Spinney. You know him as Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch. By the way, you can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations. Also on YouTube and Facebook. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.